Once again, it's on. We are on with the Black Comic Lords. Thank you all for showing up. As you know, Black Comic Lords have been doing a Black Comic Creators series. Now, um, as, as, as we've said before, the Black Comic Lords are about three important things. The celebration, the education on, and the upliftment of Black comic characters, books, and Black comic creators. Those men and women who toil uh, every day, um, putting pen to paper to give you and I our, 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 our books with the, uh, with the colored pictures on flimsy paper that we care about so much. So um, a lot of these creators don't get the shine that they get. A lot of us don't know who they are, um, and these are super talented people that don't get enough accolades, and this is what this is all about. Let's find out who they are. So to that end, the last few interviews that we've had have focused on a very special book from a very special company called Milestone Comics. Um, Milestone has its 30th anniversary. Um, they celebrated their 30th birthday on February 27th, 1993. And they have an anthology book to celebrate that fact. Um, we recently interviewed Evan Narcisse. And um, great interview. Um, talking about uh, the the opening book that they have with, with Icon. And um, sort of uh, basically the entire milestone line um yesterday last night we had lamar giles talk about static and tonight we're going to talk about your favorite crew the blood syndicate with no no other no other than the biggest fan in the world jeffrey thorne and one of the newest hottest artists out there right now uh sean damian hill so with that hey fellas Welcome to the spot. Say Thank hi. Thank you. Glad to be back. All right. Hello. Hi, Hello, you. everybody. Hi. How's everybody Hi. doing? Oh, we're good. We're good. We're good. Thank you all for, living, for, living, for being here tonight. Um, Jeffrey, you are probably the self-appointed biggest Blood Syndicate fan in the world. <laughs> what? Who said that? I think oh you God. said it the last time we interviewed you. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm deep in this. I'm deep in the blood syndicate from day one, but uh, I'm sure there are people who could be contenders. But yeah, I, I love the syndicate. I, 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 I love the syndicate. I love the syndicate. Well, look, you know, as I said, sometimes I notice that a lot of people don't know who these creators are. And um, I think it's real important that we uh, let your fans get more insight as to who you guys are. So, let me, Sean, let me start with you. Uh, uh, what was like the first comic book you ever read that you can recall reading? Oh, man, absolute first. Um, so, uh, my family was hugely into comics, like my mother and grandmother. I'm sorry, my grandfather and, and mom specifically. So, the first one I remember reading was um, Legion of Superheroes. Really? Yeah, yeah, it was Legion of Superheroes. How old do you was... think you were? Oh, man. Um, definitely in elementary, but I was probably like, probably like six or seven. I think it was just a way for her to try to get me to read more. I was just like not reading, and that, and, that, and I came from a family of readers, and they were just like, "What's wrong with you?" So I think that's how a lot of us got in the comics. Our parents yeah. saw us uh, and, and uh, gravitate from watching cartoons, and we see the funny pages, the funny pictures, and we point to it, and they're like, "Well, it's got words in it. Let's get them to read." That's how yeah. it was me. Yeah. yeah. What about you, uh, Jeff? What was the, what is the first comic book you recall ever reading? Uh, Commandy, I want to say 12. Hold on, let me look it up. Oh, uh, wow, that's, that's really Commandy. random. Oh, Commandy 16. Commandy 16. Oh, I remember it very well. But what's interesting is that was the first floppy comic I ever read, but the first 
comics I ever read were in this big book, this big hardcover book called The Great Comic Book Superheroes that my dad got me one Christmas. And it had like the original Human Torch, the Spirit, Plastic Man for some reason, um, <laughs> Namor. But like all of this was like 1940s stuff, like from when he was a kid. Right. And I was like, what is this? Um, and I was kind of hooked on it. So he's parent parental, like first taste story again. Uh, he's like, well, if you like that, you know, they sell these things on on uh, on racks at supermarkets and grocery stores. And stuff. I'm like what? Right. Really? You know, so <laughs> the first one, I think I, it might not be the first one I read, but it's the first one that's stuck in my head. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Kamani was like insane. Like, people don't even get it. Like, you got a picture this little, I wasn't even 10 years old yet, picking up this story about a world where there's one human person and everybody else is a giant humanoid animal. And there's no explanation <laughs> except there was a disaster, right? They're like, the second page of the book has the Statue of Liberty floating in the ocean. And him on a little raft going, oh, guess what's on? It's all on me. And I was like, all right, I'm here for this. Um, Planet of the uh, Apes. Uh, and the one, yeah. oh my God, it was Planet of all the animals for that. But yeah, <laughs> uh, the apes were the bad guys, the tigers and the lions. That was awesome. It was. I was like, because Kirby was just like, he did not care. Like, he, just, he was like, it's comic books. I can do what I want. You know, and I was like, oh, okay, Jack. Like, I'm a Kirbyite from that from that day to this day. Like he's my man. Well, Sean, how how did you get into uh, into doing art? Oh man, so I mean, my grandfather used to draw like all the time. He he wasn't like um, a professional artist, but he was um, he was an avid comic book fan, and so he was always doing sketches from those from those books. And uh, he was hugely into like um, music, so particularly jazz. So right. he was always doing sketches of jazz musicians and stuff like that. Like I would go down into his like uh, the basement of the house. He kind of made it into his man cave and stuff like that. So you would see like sketches of like Miles Davis and Duke Ellington just, just plastered all over the walls and stuff like that. And it was just that um, was like probably my first introduction to art and that people can do it besides me just, you know, attempting to draw. What was your first like, sort of a official comic book job that you did? Oh, official comic book job? Like yeah. um so what's the first work you got paid to do? What's the in, in a comic book? Oh, that's a lot different. Um so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, here uh, we go. Rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, so uh really it was um this group out in Atlanta called uh, Terminus Media. And um, at the time, like my, my wife, then girlfriend was, it finally convinced me that I should try to pursue um, comics as a career. So I was um, drawing my own pages, trying to get myself together. And then um, I just start pushing it to different, any, any website, any online website that, that accepted online submissions, I pretty much pushed it as much as I could. And um Terminus Media was one of the companies that that kind of that contacted me and was just like, "Hey, we have this um, book called Amber Fox. We might want you to to, to illustrate it for us." And um, you know, uh, that's when I met a good friend of mine, Robert Jeffrey, and he was the writer. And um, yeah, I knew that's that. yeah, <laughs> that's when um, that that's really it. The funny thing was, I didn't even I didn't know anything about this business. Like, I didn't know. Like uh, what you get paid. I didn't know like what, like we have to send an invoice or anything like that. I didn't know anything. So um, I got the book done, and then they called me and it's like, okay, how much do we pay you? And I'm like, <laughs> you hadn't worked that out ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, was like, I was just happy to get the book. I was just like, you know, I was I was like, they literally told. Me, I remember Tony Kid on the phone asking, "Is like, um, uh, we have money." we have to give it to you how much <laughs> and so what's and your just, rate and it, <laughs> oh yeah exactly what's my page rate i'm like page rate and so um i don't know what i blurped out but um they what, what, what issue no you said amber fox what issue was it the first issue uh, oh man 
I think it was maybe the first full issue because um, I know they've had some publications with the with the character before with like some short stories and stuff like that in a, in a collected years, edition. Years from now, years from now, maybe not even years. In a short while, I would expect when your name blows up even bigger than it is, they're gonna go. Where oh. can I find the first issue by Sean Hill? Oh, and then uh, people uh, are gonna try and track down that Amber Fox num- full first full issue. So they, that's the first they, work of Sean Hill. They might still be able to get it at Challengers Games and Comics. I don't know. <laughs> it's like might still be able to get it. Tony Kate's still owned in there. So, what would you say is your? It was for both of you. Who would you say is your favorite comic book characters? Oh Lord, uh, so um, much more there. Yeah. Um, well, for big. Uh, two, um, at, the, at Marvel, it would be the Prowler, Hobie yeah. Brown, not Aaron okay. Davis, I think his name is. Um, I love the Prowler, love the Prowler. And at DC, uh, Oracle, Barbara Gordon, Oracle. Oh, okay. Yeah, people don't expect that, but that was, Oracle was hard as hell, dude. Oh, my God. Uh, I loved Oracle. I, I was I was gonna swear that you were gonna say Green Lantern. I wore a green shirt just in in, in you know homage no, to that. Oracle. No, okay. that was just the pitch that got sold. That's not my favorite. That was that's, that's John's deep. like John's like probably in my top twenty, but I don't think he's in my top ten. Okay. Sean so John Stewart's my favorite. Him. John Stewart's definitely my favorite Green Lantern. Um, but like as far as favorite character, um, like. Who would you like to work on the most? Oh man, that's a longer list. But um, so <laughs> my my favorite character, the character I've always um liked the most, has uh, at least uh f- for Marvel is has been Magneto. I've always been uh, interested in that character. I know he's a villain or you know a villain or whatever. But um, I always thought his reasoning was very extreme, but kind of realistic compared to Charles. You don't, you don't like to use <laughs> labels like heroes and villains here. I mean... Yeah, okay. Good, good. <laughs> but um, let's, not, let's not use labels. Because I was just like, you know, like Charles, they they are going to keep trying to kill you. I mean, it's always going to be this way. Why don't you accept it? Um, but, and that's just for the Marvel side. For DC, um, it's always been between like, like but besides like I've never been a huge Green Lantern fan, but the only Green Lantern I've ever liked consistently was Jon Stewart. And besides him, um, I always liked Blue Devil. Like I've I've always wanted to draw him. I just Blue never Devil, had. Okay. Yeah. I can't never make him work. Uh, it's so funny. Yeah, it I, never know. I don't know to why. Amaze me when I ask these questions of the creators, like your answers routinely are not what people expect. I always find it fascinating because as fans, we have the, the, the stuff that we like and creators, their, their answers routinely are a lot more different than what the fans are. And I think that's, you know, you guys put a lot of thought into it as to what, what inspires you, what, you know, you find fascinating. Well, but, generally you know, I follow, I don't follow characters generally. Right. I follow creators generally. So, ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Same here. So if you pull out a character, um, it's generally going to be somebody that had a limited run because generally you associate that character with their creator. And then if it had a limited run or the creator left the book, I might not follow the book anymore if it wasn't drawn by or wasn't written by person X. Um, So it's difficult to have it. Global Guardians. Oh my God! Stop bringing up stuff that broke my heart. Oh my God! <laughs> someone, ah, someone's under, yeah. someone's under homework on you. Know about your vixen in the Golden oh Go- Golden God. Gu- Global Guardians. <laughs> oh, that broke my heart. We had such big plans for that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like I follow creators. So the character to rise up above the others in some way, they basically have to have something kind of extra going for them. For yeah. me, um, Hobie, like, uh, what's his name? Stan would basically make up the same character over and over again, but this time he was black. It was a black super genius basically from the streets, which is all Peter Parker is, is a 
white yeah. super genius basically from the streets, right? Uh, except uh, Hobie didn't have any of Peter's uh, advantages. Right. Um, he didn't have any of Tony Stark's for sure. And he built himself a costume and made himself Spider-Man capable with found objects, basically. And I was like, right. that's my man right there. Yeah. That's a formidable yeah. brain right there. You need to not mess with Hobie. Um, and with um, Barbara, turning her into Oracle, I thought was a genius writer move because everybody universally sort of at the time was like, why would you do that in the killing joke? Why would you, why would you paralyze Barbara Gordon? What the hell, man? Right? And Chuck Dixon did a thing called No Man's Land where basically right. Batman was out of the picture and Gotham was destroyed in an earthquake and somebody found out where Oracle, who was helping out all the superheroes, lived. Sh shout out to Joe Willis for like No weekend. Man's Land. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Favorite Global Guardian. Well, I'm gonna not. I'm gonna be a jerk and say my favorite Global Guardian is the one I made up, which is Impala too. Okay. Yeah, me and Chris have big plans for him. But um, basically, everybody, all these mercenaries broke into Oracle's house. They figured out where she lived. Like they didn't know who she was. They thought, oh, this is where Oracle is, and they broke into the house. And it's like this chick in a wheelchair handled these eight mercenaries i mean handle them like begging for mercy please don't kill me madam like i was like go go so that was my that's my girl yeah, it was it was a, um, there was a, um yeah. the titans television show had the wheelchair bound barbara gordon and she ended up mm -hmm. having to get into situations where she had to defend herself and she was still able to do it from the wheelchair i thought that was kind of dope yeah, um, she's, 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 so, so, uh, in so, the comics, her and it doesn't matter. I'll go off on that for hours. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just to bring you in. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're here to talk about Milestone Comics. Uh, I wanted to know, you know. Oh, it's my man, Kane. Sean, we're, 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 you're the youngest guy on, on this live. So were you a fan of Milestone, the original Milestone back in the day? Did you learn about it much later? Uh, no, I, I knew about Milestone. I, I Consistently collected the books. Um, some of them were older back issues by the time I, I really got into it, but I definitely remember Blood Syndicate a lot because they they just felt different. They weren't really like a team, like a superhero team at all back then. They, they get insulted um, when you when you refer to them as that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and it was um it was it was just a, um, I, I remember like um, I remember how they were described to me when I was in the comic store. They were described to me like they're a gang, and yeah. I was just like, "What? Like, why would they like what? call them yeah. a gang?" Like, and um, so uh, they handed me an issue, and I forget what the issue was, but um, it it was um, I think it was during the time where Holocaust was a member of the team. And he would just be in the most extra. I don't want to curse, but uh, <laughs> grimy that he could possibly grimy. be. Grimy, yeah, yeah, just yeah. the grimiest dude that you could ever meet, and um, <laughs> literally like give the folks drugs to make them forget about their pain. Literally on the team, just, just, <laughs> just like whatever. And I'm just like, what is this? This is like too real. Um, and I was still a kid at the time, so I, I, I don't think my mom knew that I was buying those books. But um, I, if she did, she probably would have took them away. But um, <laughs> no, it was it was like the realest thing ever. I was just like, oh my god, I need more of this. It was you like some, it was you like some, you got a fan out here. It says, "Yeah, uh, oh, I'm Anthony F." Hey, oh my god, uh, sorry. It's like I, this is a very like insulated job like you sit here and you just draw and you really I, I have little to no understanding of like what kind of impact any of my work does on people but it's just well look you, i know uh you know, it was interesting i was telling you about this beast. behind the, you uh, should just bro. own it huh i uh, try but He's uh i mean i got a lot of help like it, anthony yeah. Yeah. Me a lot. <laughs> like, you know it's, 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 a lot i was telling you work, this so. before, before we got on like you, you've been in the black comic lord space for a minute like I, I remember you. Yeah. You know, just making comments here and there, and then when I saw, you know, one of the first books that you dropped, which was it? Was it Islam our first? 
I don't remember what, I was, what it was, but the, there was a, there was a comic that came out because it pops up. We post books in the space all the time, and it said Sean Damian Hill, and it you like said, hey, I've got this book coming out. I'm like, why is this? Why is this dude who's in our, who's in our Facebook group talking about he's got a book coming out? Like, why is why is he front? Who's me? this Mark pretending to be a comic? Who's this dude? Who's this dude pretending like right? he's got a comic coming out? And then I realized, oh snap! Wait, two and two together, it's the same guy. <laughs> yeah, because you like so low key <laughs> humble, like you don't mention. Oh yeah, by the way, I got this deal. I got this, you know, Marvel book coming out. I got this book with Greg Elise coming out. You know, you, you, you never mention anything. You just kind of low key in the space. I just, man, I, I get so because it's it's like comics is it's labor intensive. And you just, and you know, and you have to just balance it out with all the other things you got going on in your life. And so, right. you know, it's a thing where you, you, you can't do it unless you love it. Like you literally can't unless you love it or, or you at least you shouldn't unless you love it. Um, so it's like, and I do love comics. I have my whole life. And so, um, you know, when I get into that headspace of just cre- working on creating a story, um, it's just not like I want that work to kind of speak for itself. I don't want to really talk about it. I'm an introvert anyway. Like, why am I talking so much about it? I want people to just kind of see it. Um, I want to see what they think about it, of course. But Well, know. I'm sure that you've seen the comments about your work in the Black Comic Lord space, and you can see that it's overwhelmingly positive. Um, it was. Joy. <laughs> you guys have been hugely nice to me. <laughs> so there's nothing for us being nice. We just we like what we like, and we like your work, man. It was a good job. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate so it. So we're we're going to get into this new book that you've got coming out. I mean, the, the milestone anthology book. Um, you've got a story coming out, Blood Syndicate epilogue. It's kind of the uh, well. We'll talk about what it what what that represents. It's coming out March 21st, and we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we're going to get into the book. Black Comic Lords. I nominate Icon for lead membership. Are you ready? Let's go. Hi, L.A. Shears here, and welcome to a very special edition of Black Comic Lords' new comic book rush. On this episode, we're dedicating it completely to Milestone's 30th anniversary. The action-packed, timeline-tweaking, Icon vs. Hardware series leads up to Milestone's 30th anniversary. So let's start with book one. Icon vs. Hardware, number one. When Hardware discovers a long-suppressed time machine hidden in a government warehouse, his obsession with righting the wrongs of the past, those of both American history and his own tragic family, will unravel the fabric of time for the Milestone universe. Icon vs. Hardware, number two. With time itself under Hardware's control, the hierarchy of power in the Dakotaverse has changed. Having altered events so the Big Bang itself never happened, Curtis Metcalf now finds himself as the head of Alpha Industries, but the world is still on the brink of chaos. Can Hardware stop his alternate timeline self from dooming us all? Icon versus Hardware number three. Hardware's rampant tampering with the timeline has weakened the boundaries of reality and unraveling not just his own history, but the history of the entire Milestone universe. And as the cracks in the wall of creation start to show, a terrifying threat emerges from the most unexpected place. The ending of this issue is going to shock you. Icon versus Hardware number four. Well, Hardware fooled around and now he's found out. From outside the walls of the known universe comes a terrifying, seemingly unbeatable, and deeply unexpected enemy. Brainiac? The events of this issue will alter the course of the multiverse forever. And now the moment we have all been waiting for. Milestone's 30th anniversary special, number one. Celebrating 30 years of static, Icon, Rocket, Hardware, and the rest of the Dakotaverse in this star-studded anthology. From a Static and Batman Beyond team-up, harkening back to their adventures in the Static Shock animated series, a grown-up Raquel Irving inherited the mantle of Icon, a reality-warping story where the present-day Milestone characters meet their 1993 counterparts. There's something for every Milestone fan to enjoy. 
So you've seen the amazing variant covers. You've heard the incredible stories. You know what to do. Pre-order now. L.A. Shears signing out. Till next time. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Look, as you guys know, I'm like one of the biggest milestone fans of all time. I'm just throw it out there. If there's a bigger one, then you know you can challenge me. But I'm one of the biggest ones out there. And I had the opportunity to read this milestone 30th anthology book. And I can tell you, fans that are also big milestone fans, um, this is a must-have book. This is a this is a this is milestone's love letter to their fans. Um, one of the reasons we just played that commercial, shout out to Amber Shears, one of the newest members of the Black Comic Awards, putting that video together for us. Um, we've got this current series going out with uh, Reggie Hudlin, Dennis Cowan, uh, Yara Montanez, um, the Icon versus Hardware series. Um, and the that sort of storyline is going to ultimately sort of run up to what's going on in this anthology book. Um, when we left off with the Blood Syndicate with issue six of season one, Jeffrey Thorne did a couple things. <laughs> My man not only brought back the Blood Syndicate from 30 years ago, he revamped them for the 21st century, but still managed to keep the core of who they are the same. I mean, 30 years time span, took the same characters, put them in the 21st century, and still kept the same vibe updated for a new audience. So if you've never read Blood Syndicate, you could still get into the newer one. Y'all know how difficult that is? My man did that with ease. So, you know, shout out to him. He's mad humble. <laughs> you know, I think it comes Yay, from really passionate about the characters. Um, but where they left off, Blood Syndicate had, you know, killed Holocaust, right? And declared Paris Island its own separate territory from the rest of Dakota. Tech Nine tells Icon and Rocket that he and the Blood Syndicate have what they have planned next for Paris Island. He says one word to Icon, which you see on the panel there. He says, Tortuga. He's not talking about the rum cake that you get when you go on the cruise ships <laughs> in the Caribbean. <laughs> if you've been on the cruise, <laughs> just, 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 just run with me on this. Okay. That one word is enough to make Icon leave. Just fly off and allow the blood syndicate to shoot their shot in the new Paris Island. Now, for those that don't know, and I, I actually did a little research on this so I can get this right. From 1630, the year 1630 onward, the island of Tortuga was divided into French English colonies, allowing buccaneers, or as they're more commonly known, pirates to use the island as their main base of operations. In 1633, the first slaves were, enslaved people were imported from Africa to aid in these plantations. However, by 1635, the use of slaves had ended. The slaves were said to be out of control on the island. Apparently they had some problems with being enslaved and wild out. You know. <laughs> So while at the same time, there had been continuous disagreements and fighting between the French and the English colonies over this territory. So what then followed was fighting amongst the English, the French, the Spanish, even the Dutch got some, some time in for control of this island, the region and the resources that could make any nation wealthy in Europe. But what they, what they did to do that was use these privatized mercenaries or pirates as hired guns of these European nations. So what's interesting, and, and I find this stuff fascinating. My father, my, my family's from Jamaica. My father's from Jamaica. 
And my father um, was a college professor. His area of specialty was, uh, he's an economist. So the English speaking, um, the political economy of the English speaking Caribbean. And so oh, damn. if you study history and you study economics and you study the economics of the Western hemisphere and how it came into being, he used to do this lecture. I used to have this lecture my entire life. Even when I sat in on his, in his college class, he talked about this. That the key to the civilization of the of the civilization or, or colonization, I should say, of the Western Hemisphere is one substance: sugar. Yep. Sugar is why we are all here in the Western Hemisphere. Ultimately, if you want to, I'll show you books and we can talk about that. But the point I'm trying to make. These pirates ended up developing a civilization on Tortuga. They became so powerful because they owned all these resources, including sugar, that the European nations had to recognize them as a power. Um, so when they actually had to make a pirate code on Tortuga to run this place, which is, you know, you got pirates, you got prostitutes, you got, you know, uh, all types of ill-gotten gains. It's basically a huge red light district. And they developed a pirate code to help everything run. And so when Jeffrey Thorne here writes, what are you going to do with Paris Island? He says, Tortuga. <laughs> um, uh, visualize, <laughs> visualize what could possibly be coming in context of all this. Um, so well, my question for you, my, my question for you, Jeffrey, is, how bad is it going to get in Paris Island? And who's going to be Henry Morgan in this situation? <laughs> well, a um, couple of things. Um, and I say, I don't want to spoil the actual thing because some of this comes up in the story. What you're, some of what you're talking about comes up in the story. But there's a European description of what was going on in Tortuga. And then there's the we were there description of what was going on in Tortuga. Okay. Exactly. All of what you just said is exactly true. But the thing that is left out of most history books is these people were, which is why it fits the blood syndicate, by the way, pirates were the kings and queens of their own ships. Okay. Um, but ships didn't run like you do it or I kill you. That, there's no way you can have an organization that works like that. Pirate ships are almost, almost, perfectly democratic in that their idea was you lead us, you make us money, we'll do what you say. But at any point, if the whole crew is like, get out, you're out. Okay. That was on every ship because otherwise you just have mutinies and people fighting for fighting for control and you couldn't get any business done. Right. Picture these people like street gangs on the water. Okay. But you couldn't trust each other. You couldn't do anything if your number two is constantly trying to kill the number one, because then number three would move up to number two, and he would be trying to kill the new number one. Can't have you can't do business, right? So that's how they would work in their own ships. And it was basically, you keep us fat and happy, we will murder and take anything you guys want us to pick. Cool, right? But when they had to set up on an island to have a base, you had nineteen kings and queens used to doing whatever the hell they want with their own people. And part of the fun of being a pirate even then was no, no boot on my neck at all. I get on my boat and I rule. I take what I want and I do what I want and to hell with everybody, right? So but you're, you're trying to set up this whole like situation that. with that in Paris Island, but with superpowers <laughs> Well, here's and bang thing. babies. What also happened while France and France and um, France and England are fighting over the territory and the Dutch and the, and the Spaniards a little bit, right? Everybody's trying to get that 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 sweet sugar trade. The pirates right. were already there, right? And they were like, and we don't care. We will murder you, okay? And the only thing prior to the pirate code, the general pirate code, that kept it sort of even was they would also murder each other, right? Pirates would go after other pirates. But the pirate code was like, look, you take that region, I'm going to be over here. Territories were set up. And when we're on Tortuga, no static at all. 
right? And on Tortuga, there's a council of the pirates. And who voted for it? Everybody. So they were the most cutthroat, cut your throat as soon as look at you, rape your daughter in front of you. People. But they founded a representative democracy because it was the only way it could work. And as soon as they did that, the European powers were like, oh, oh, no, wait, no, what? You will join forces occasionally? You will share your revenue? You will send a representative to talk to us about trade? Do you think you're a country or something? And the pirates were like, well, we weren't going that route, but if you want to make it be like that, just as long as you don't mess with us, everything's good, right? People got disgruntled. Big power started buying off people like, look, I know you're not happy with how things are down there. Let us give you a little change. You can hunt your former friend. You'll never be called a pirate again, and we'll give you a little money on top of it. Anything you take, you get to keep 50% of, right? That's where the privateers came from. They're all ex-pirates. Now, blah, 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 blah. What is, what is, pirate, what is the blood syndicate? They're surviving members of the strongest gang under the leadership of a guy who was never in any of those gangs. He's just a soldier back from the war, right? And he's like, here's how we're going to do this, because my parents raised me right. And if you'll notice, you yourself, Paul specifically, the only successful slave rebellion in that whole entire period, Haiti. Right. Where was Holocaust people from? Haiti. Haiti. Mm-hmm. Okay. And where is uh, where is Tech Nine's family from? His mother's okay. from Haiti. And all... Right. So they all got the real story of what was going on, the people's version of what was going on. Holocaust went one way, Tech 9 went the other way. But at the end of the day, the solution is autonomy. You have to have autonomy. So he's like, oh, my God, here we are in this moment. I didn't realize everybody had juice like me and my boy do. I thought it was just the two of us coming out of the war with some superpowers. Oh, it's like this? Oh, hell no. We're keeping this. Like, Holocaust got it wrong. But now that it's broken, we're taking it, right? Right. It's, it's like you have these two guys from the, the flip sides of the f- same coin. They both have Haitian mm-hmm. backgrounds. They both want. They both recognize that Paris Island needs to be its own separate entity. They both want to create their own governments or however you want to phrase it. Um, they just had yep. different ways to do it. One wanted to rape, kill, and, and pillage. The other one wants oh. to have some type of organization. So the question is, the question of blood syndicate asks, and it may not be me writing this, but what I've set up, if it's not me for the next writer, is it's easy to knock over a tyrant. It's very difficult to rule, right? And you have a person who doesn't want to be king. He just wants everybody to be treated well. Tech Nine right. is basically Captain America, except right. he'll shoot you in the face, <laughs> right? It's everything except- Literally. Well, you know what I say? On Paris Island, we don't put you in jail. If we have a problem, we solve that problem permanently. We don't have any, oh, well, let's rehabilitate. No, 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 no. Right? So. Azor B says, great way to incorporate some history. Look, that's what Milestone's about. Milestone's about us. And when I mean us, I mean all the people who never get the spotlight in the mainstream. So. Remember, I'm a black dude. I'm writing about a lead Latin character. But people forget those islands are mixtures of all of these different people. So you can have both right. Holocaust and Tech Nine trace their ancestry back to that same island, the Caribbean. Right? All of that's in this yeah. mix. There's more than one kind of Asian person in this story. When Kwai shows up, her and Third Rail, they're not at all from the same traditions. I mean, even a little bit, right? There's multiple Spanish speakers on the same team, right? You got all of that stuff is because the life of the diaspora includes all of these people. So what moves us, what motivates us, what you said about your dad, my own parents, my split in my family, uh, Caribbean on one side, traditional slave descendant on the other side, although technically the Caribbeans are also slave descendant, even though they right. don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. All of that's in the mix in this in in all of Milestone and in the Blood Syndicate, it's down on the street. So, I, I mean, it, it was a great opportunity. It was everything that Ivan Velez Jr. was doing in the nineties. It's just right. thirty a years. A lot ago. of that, a, many of those problems. Yeah, but many of those problems got either solved or made put into a different context, right? 
what you have now is the the and I shut up so Sean can talk a bit because he came in like fire <laughs> when he came in to do the stuff. But you have the last surviving members of multiple gangs gang gang families essentially pirate crews. Um, none of the others were told we're doing this at the end of the series, right? Why son's like what the hell is a blood syndicate? <laughs> what is that, <laughs> right? Tech Nine made this stuff up as he was fighting Holocaust. Like, as this was going on, he's like, wait, wait, whoa, what? Right? So the following is these, like, everyone's got their own constituencies. Everyone's got their own families that they got to look after. Everyone's got their own hoods that they got to take care of. All of that stuff is still in play. Right? Except yeah, now this, we're this, running the island. And if it, you know. This, oh, the this last whole thing. thing the, seems, the European yeah. power shut down the pirates. Because they had enough power to do that, right? That's the that's the end of that story. The difference between the Paris Island crew and the pirates is each one of these people is basically an army. Like any one member of the Blood Syndicate can handle most of what you're sending their way. So the team of them, every nation would be like, okay, let's all back up and treat these people very gently, <laughs> right? Like very very gently. <laughs> let's see how this plays out. That's 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 the question I had from you because that that last point you mentioned, the difference between Tortuga and Paris Island, it was a, a matter of power, you know. Paris mm -hmm. Island, in that one little area with all of these poor people of color, have more power than all of the surrounding forces outside of Paris Island in the Greater Dakota area. So that's that could be the difference. And the person who notes that is a character that we have not seen in 30 years, which is Dharma. You bring back Dharma and the Shadow Cabinet. Now, I'm not going to do a spoiler, but, you know... Uh, oh, <laughs> God, that picture's so awesome. Oh, my God, I want that picture on my wall. You, oh you, guys, haven't seen, you guys haven't seen the finished version of this picture, have you? No. I haven't seen the book. Wow, so I'm actually ahead of you guys. All I've seen is my part of it. I've only seen my part of it. All right, so here's here's yeah. Darm in the, in the left-hand side, and you've got Iron Butterfly, one of my favorite characters from Miles... <coughs> Excuse me, from Milestone. And Dharma notes all of the chaos that's going on. And Iron Butterfly takes him to task and basically is like, you've been watching all these people and pulling all these strings, he's like the ultimate puppeteer. Mm. He's basically a clairvoyant puppet master. How much of what has happened so far in Milestone, <coughs> excuse me, Milestone 2.0 has been his doing? I mean, all of what's been happening in Milestone is Reggie and Dennis. <laughs> That's what's really been happening. So, um, I will say this, um, uh, Dharma has been involved in um, a lot of stuff in my mind. Uh, I, my camera shifted because the TV went crazy. I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the screen properly. But um, I have ideas for the Shadow Cabinet, but as as you know, with these with these big um, with these big companies. Really, everything centers around Dennis and and Reggie. So, I have plans for both the Blood Syndicate and the Shadow Cabinet, but I don't know how they fit in with what uh, Dennis and, and 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 Reggie have planned for the overall line. I know there's some big stuff coming that I did not anticipate when I was. I mean, there's no way I could have. When you see what it is, it'd be like there's no way you could have known this. But um, yeah, I, I mean. The Shadow Cabinet, Dharma is um, Dharma is a complicated man and nobody understands him but his woman. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, he, he's, he, Dharma in my mind is the guy that will, he will make any deal as long as, he, the ends justify the means. He's the ends justify the means guy, right? There's something really awful that he knows is definitely or most likely coming. And he's trying to get all his chips stacked up so that when it gets here, we're ready for it. And if that means I have to make a deal with human traffickers, cool. I don't have to like them. I just have to have them in the key position I need them in. So when this thing happens, they're ready for it. 
right? Yeah. Um, that's that's how we, that's how I played. That's how I played Dharma. Now, is that how Reggie and Dennis want Dharma to be played? I have no idea. So. <laughs> You know. Well, hope, hope, hopefully they keep you on for 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 season two because I I really want to see where you're gonna go with this. Dude, I'm here so, for all of it. If they let me in. They let me in once. I'm happy. I, I will now not. I will no longer murder people for not letting me do the blessing. That's all. <laughs> you're supposed to keep that on the low level, bro. All right. So, so Sean, <laughs> Sean, um, you caused me a moment of slight embarrassment. Oh, I oh. hope. So here's here's what happened. You know, the Black Comic Lords. We did a um, a roundtable series about milestone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, Jeffrey Thorne and Crisscross, the legendary Crisscross, one of the yes. best artists to come out of the milestone universe. Yes, he is. Um, That's my man. You know, they blessed us by by coming to the roundtable. And so I'm going through and I'm talking about stuff and I'm talking about his art and was it, was it, what was it the blood syndicate? Anyway, at some point I talked to Chris Cross about his art on blood syndicate. And I point out this issue five, I'm like, look at this panel from issue five. And I'm going on about how dope his artwork is. And he goes, that wasn't me. That was yeah, Sean David that Hill. That was not me. <laughs> you, you remember that, Jeffrey? He's like, that's that's not yeah, me. That I was do. that that was Sean David. I was like, who? <laughs> Sean, <laughs> Sean, wait, I'm looking it up. Sean Damien. After after we're done, I'm like looking up Sean Damien. Wait, that, that actually is not crisscross. Yeah. It's Sean Damien Hill. And I'm looking at the picture, and I'm like, that's that dude who's been on a Facebook page. Yeah. <laughs> It's the it's same like, guy. Yeah, he came in hard, right? He came in hard. Bro, as so, well on this book. I mean, I'm looking at this artwork here. This is this is from issue. What is this issue five? This is the first work he did on Blood Syndicate, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And look, the best artwork, Chris Cross's artwork has was already dope from 30 years ago. It was, in my yeah. opinion, groundbreaking. Um, I agree. And I think he's one of the best comic book artists out there. Yeah. But when he did Blood Syndicate, his artwork went a whole nother level. Yeah, yeah. The, the evolution of his artwork. And I think it's a true testament that I'm reading issue five, and I didn't even realize that wasn't Chris Cross's artwork at first. Um, you just yeah. seamlessly stepped in Um. And I've and here's the thing, I've seen your artwork in other places, in other books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And your art style is is different. So you like you somehow made your artwork complement or seem just very similar to Chris Cross's artwork. Did you do that intentionally? No, no. But um, to be honest, like Chris Cross is an influence, like, like, you know, and, and to be honest, when I, I initially like came in on issue four to help out, but, um, and I, I cannot tell you how nervous I was drawing that book. Like it was it, even this, even issue five, cause it was just like, it's like, it's coming after Chris Cross and it's like, you know, I remember reading Blood Syndicate as a kid and Chris Cross artwork literally in my head, like, Right, Blood Syndicate is his artwork to me. So, yeah. literally coming yeah. in, it's like it's like if I was asked to draw like X Men and 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 while Jim Lee just finishes his run, it's like that's what it's going on in my mind. And I was it's like, like it's like no pressure, nervous. no pressure. Oh yeah, no pressure at all. You know, you just gotta <laughs> you just gotta make sure you measure up to this artist you think is perfect, and then you know. Um, and it, it, to be honest, like he has some wild out of the box storytelling that to me is like, I thought I would never be able to keep up with that. Um, and Did I'm not he give entirely... you any tips or advice or anything like that? Nope. Nope. I really wanted to bother him though. <laughs> I really wanted to bother him and see <laughs> like how I was doing. Um, I, I. You came, did... you came to play, man. Don't even worry about that. I. Don't even worry about that. <laughs> 
Uh, you, 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 should, you should, you honestly should have bothered him. I actually uh, got yeah. a chance to interview him just uh, several days ago with yeah, Evan Narcisse because they talked about their portion of the, and he said how Dennis Cowan used to always um, talk in his ear about, yeah. you know, be bolder, be, be strong. I forget the term he used, but he's like, do more, do more. So Milestone's always had that, that level of mentorship. So I think you probably could have gotten away with with bugging him for help because yeah, you know, probably should have been a milestone thing. Should have been a nice man. Should have bugged him on every panel, but uh, I, I I reached out nah, to him on nah, a couple of different nah. things just to see how he was, um, especially for issue four, just to make sure that like we're drawing the same thing, you know. But um, or you know, especially like the same place and backgrounds and stuff. But um. Yeah, no. Uh, I didn't intentionally try to copy his style or anything like that. It's, it's just that the Jeffrey's writing was it seemed to me to be extremely energetic in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. And so to me, uh, it just made sense to try to keep up with that same energy and that same, that same liveliness. Um, and a lot of and a lot of the work that's already being produced. So I was like, man, I, I just, you know, I might be nervous as hell trying to draw this book and I'm just gonna have to keep up. That's just just the way it is. So Well, you, you did an um, you did an excellent job. I mean that that picture to the right with icon holding rocket. I oh, mean that should be you. like that should be like a poster or something. I mean that's just that's just I can't uh, tell you. Can't tell you how many times I redrew that face because icons icon um is like I used to like him more than Superman as a kid, to be honest. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I, I never, I never, I've never felt like I satisfyingly drew him uh, the way I wanted to. And this, uh, but no, it's <laughs> uh, editor liked it, so I was like, <laughs> "Well, you just said something that I'm was interesting." You, you, said, when I, when I... you said, "You said I was never satisfied in, in in the way I drew him." I can tell you that Chris Cross had a very simple, similar thing. That he was never satisfied with his art, which is why he's always working on improving it. So keep that energy, because yeah. that uh, that yeah. apparently is what what makes you great. What were you going to say, Jeff? And I was nervous as hell. Well, I was going to say I was nervous as hell when they said Chris is not going to be able to, you know, do it do issue five. And I was like, what? What? Well, are we going to delay? Why don't we delay? And they're like, oh, we don't delay around here. What? What do you mean? <laughs> no, we're going to bring in Mr. Hill. And I was like, I don't know his work. I quickly looked up his work. And I realized I did know it. I just didn't know his name to attach to that work. And I was like, okay, I am cautiously optimistic that this will work out. I was nervous because, you know, just how you felt, Sean. I was like, this is Chris Cross. You know, is yeah. this guy going to come in and like, is he going to shift the tone? Is he going to draw his way? And it wasn't a matter of whether he was good or bad. It was like, is it going to be too dramatic of a shift? Right. Mm -hmm. And when those first pencils came through, I was like, okay, cool. Like, not even just cool. I was like, damn. So, like, okay. So, it's like man. a murderer's row of artists, <laughs> right? I'm ready for this. Like, I like working with Sean. He has got a very cinematic um, way of expressing the imagery, right? People forget that I would say 70% of the to 100%, to depending on the writer. 70% of what you see is the cinematography and the direction choices of that illustrator. And we move so fast. I'm not looking at thumbnails, right? Sean's not sending me stick figures of, well, this is kind of how I was thinking the pages would be laid out, right? No, I'm yeah. seeing oh. finished pencils prior to inking. And I'm like, damn. So, um, wait, you went well to Ellington? Yeah, uh, that, was, that was my high school. Me too! Yeah. <laughs> oh, Look at that. that There's was, a question uh, for you, Sean. It says, I have a question for Sean. How awesome was Duke Ellington School, the School of Arts for Art classes, and where can I get my Isaiah Bradley print or commission? Congrats oh. on all your success. Oh, then you can get a Isaiah Bradley commission anytime you want. <laughs> I love that character. So it was like any any excuse to draw that character, I take. Um, yeah, I remember you you posted up in the space recently. Um, 
um, the, your, your your artwork on on Isaiah Bradley, and I remember seeing there was like a fan, a random fan on Twitter, I think, colored it. He's like, "This art is so dope, I gotta color it." Oh yeah, that was pretty recent. Yes. Yeah, yeah. that was like a couple yeah. days ago. Um, so Jeff, you said in this book, I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to give spoilers in the book, but we do see Boogeyman trying to join the Blood Syndicate because he survived after <laughs> he was one of the few survivors of of, of Holocaust. <laughs> oh. Um. So, so my next natural question I is: no, Will we have Bubba Soros? Will we have Bubba or or or, or Kwai joining the team at some point? Um, Kwai was always going to be there because she's my favorite Blood Syndicate character. Um, yeah, I worked really hard to figure a way to get her into the first, I guess, season because she didn't really fit. So the only way to do it was to do that forward jump, time jump. But um, look, people love Boogie. Boogie was great in the first run. There's no way I was going to kill off Boogie Man. No, no way, no how, no chance. But I wanted to play him in a way where that people people who weren't there for the original run don't realize what a big big reveal big boogie's identity was right all they thought was he was a rat man and then when you saw what he was like without the rat man stuff on like, oh oh what you know because all the blood syndicate have secrets and that was his big secret well that's right? an interesting question in this case, is the, is this incar yeah. incarnation of boogeyman have the same secret or is it something different oh he has that's a secret, but that's not his big secret. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, dog, dog, a version of dog would show up. Yes. The dog, Boogie, and DMZ and Kwai were the ones that I had the hardest time figuring out how to fit them into a six issue run. Because remember, the blessing is a lot of folks, you know, yeah. and they all have, each one of them could have had a book that was their own book. That was the testament to Ivan's great writing, from my point of view, is that. You could have spun out any of those characters into their own book, and it would have been a satisfying book. Any one of them. Each one was that good of a character. So um, with Boogie, he wasn't an ex-member of any of the gangs. Kwai was not an ex-member of any of the gangs, right? Dog is a dog. <laughs> so I couldn't do anything with that. And DMZ is from outer space. So it was like, okay, well, I only have six issues. I don't need to try to fold in these wrinkles right now. But I have plans, if they let me run with them, for all of those characters. Kwai, of course, has to show up for real. Uh, yeah. I have a question I need to ask. Um, think about dog. Dog's going to be more than he was. Um, dog. Hmm. Dog's going to be a player when he shows up. Um, oh snap! Uh, don't, don't mess. Yeah, yeah. Dog's going to be a player. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, the way I looked at it, the arrival of Sean made me so happy that the thing about Chris working with Chris, because I've always wanted to work with Chris and every chance I get, I work with Chris, but everybody wants to work with Chris. So his schedule doesn't always allow him to be on every book. So when right. a young gun shows up who can go, I'm like, oh, Kari Randolph. Okay, I'm going to put him in the book for later. Um, and it's the same thing that happened with Sean. So if, if Chris is not available, which I would hate, um, or if they want to do a sort of team tag team situation, I will be happy with that crew. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I want DMZ has got a whole origin story I wanted to do, um, right. but six issues wouldn't permit it. Um, uh, and Kwai is my girl. And the whole thing with the Demon Fox and all that, that is a big deal if I get to play out what I'm trying to do. Um, Man, he hearing you mention those names just makes me want to like reread those books all over again. Those books were great. I, oh, I, God, what did I say? If it ain't cool. Ivan Velez, if it, if it ain't Ivan Velez Jr., it better be me. If it ain't me, it better be him. That's the way I look yeah. at it. So, uh, here's a new question for you. Um, any new characters we will expect in Blood Syndicate? Um, Silk will be back for sure if I, if I get to write it. Um, more than just to explain how come their power, their co their powers don't destroy their costumes. <laughs> Look, I, I had a question um, about Silk. I loved the introduction of Silk. You know, one one of the things that you have in the Marvel universe 
is the idea of these costumes made out of unstable molecules. So your, your costumes never got destroyed because, you know, you know, Mr. Fantastic. But Silk gives an added element, like the idea that there is a, a, a costumer to the superheroes is really, really dope. Like that's your superpower. My superpower is to make y'all yeah. look dope. I mean, that's well, Silk's power. <laughs> Silk's power is actually. I wanted to do something with Paris Island as well. Yeah, a lot of people on Paris Island have powers now that we have not right. yet met. Um, Silk is one of those people, but Silk's not trying to be on the front lines getting his face punched in, right? He's not like, but his power is extremely formidable. So, given an ongoing story, like if if they let us have an ongoing instead of these six issue seasons. At some point, you do a solo story with Silk, where Silk's on his own, and somebody tries to mess with somebody you think to be able to easily overpower Silk. Silk makes clothing out of nothing. Silk makes clothing specific to each wearer out of nothing. So what is his power? Is his power making clothes? Or is his power making stuff out of nothing? Oh, snap. Okay? It's all in your temperament. It's all in what yeah. kind of person you are. Right. Um, that's what I wanted. Like VR, she's a brand new character. She survived because she has an interesting power set. Right. Mainly the people I killed off, and there are people who do not survive the epilogue. <laughs> wow. um, but um, the, the new people are not as expendable as you think, and the old people are not as permanent as you think. Uh, so I, I need to stop. I get I I go off on this, but like Tech got killed within what five issues of the first of yeah. the first run. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm off. still bitter about that. I'm 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 glad you didn't kill him in the well, first. Well, don't be season. bitter. <clears throat> don't don't be bitter, but don't get used to anybody. Anybody can go. That's how these people play. Anybody yeah. can be killed. That's just, part of why we keep, killed the Holocaust right off the top. Keep my boy Tech around a little bit longer. I, I love finally seeing him flex. I mean, I love I love my Captain America characters. But, uh, you know, it's a tough job being king of the first superpowered nation in, in the Dakotaverse. That's a tough yeah, job that he did not actually want to sign up for. <laughs> you know, aesthetically speaking, so, who's, whose idea was it to make the Blood Syndicate's uh, superhero costumes incorporate those, those face masks? Similar to what it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's kind of similar to what people have gotten used to daily now in our lives with the pandemic. And you and yeah. you basically oh, look at these style. pictures. Um, it's the first I time I'm seeing these colors. This is the first time you've seen I this. I mean, look at this yeah. stuff. Look at this stuff. Um, yeah. for y'all, for, for y'all are watching this, understand how dope the artwork is in this book. That that young man right there did this art. That's, look at uh, the angle. Wow. I mean, this looks like something out of a out of a oh. movie. And by the way, not to mention the, low, uh, low design, design, the design for Masquerade. The design for look Masquerade. At that, exactly. Was, was look at the design for Masquerade. No, no, no. Masquerade, Masquerade looks like an amped version up version of Falcon. You drew a better Falcon than Marvel's Falcon. Yeah. <laughs> I put it's, that design uh, of Masquerade up against any design of Falcon that's ever been done. The, uh, I, got a, the I didn't really. Masks. Man. You fixed it. The gloves are now. great. I, I love that. That elbow glove, yeah. those are great, dude. And the sneakers, I love that. Like, hell yeah. I'm blown away That'd the fact you guys haven't, even, haven't um, seen the final product yet. But I love okay, seeing your the reaction. Masks are the, the people who don't wear masks are Aquamaria, Brick, right. and Third Rail. Why? Right. Because their powers are their costume. So... I mean, what's the point of Brick wearing a mask? <laughs> He's always right. Brick out. Mm -hmm. And Third Rail, when he gets powered up, does not look like his normal self. So you wouldn't look at that guy and go, oh, that's that little skinny dude. You would never think that. And Aquamaria is water. So, like, good luck finding that chick. But the others are regular people with families and history. Right. And those things can be exploited. And I wanted to write an explicit scene into the story where they come out with their costumes but it had to be cut for paid space like silk making the costumes was an actually scripted scene that got edited out before the artist got to see it because there wasn't paid space for all of that so the masks are look we're criminals 
These are pirates. These are criminals. They're not trying to have their families get harassed and let people know who they actually are. They're using aliases right off the bat. You know, um, that's none of that's accidental. Like these people are indestructible. They're not. Most of them aren't bulletproof. Like what? Two of them are bulletproof. Three. Right. Uh, Does the silk's power I'm allow for their to... costumes to be bulletproof? Depends on the person. Theoretically, yes. The fun part about Silk, again, if Silk had his own storyline, it's trial and error, right? So, like, Tech's costume is very bullet resistant. It's heat resistant. It's a lot of stuff. But Silk would have to know what you're going to get shot with right. to make sure it can stop everything, <laughs> right? And if you don't know the caliber, right? So, I mean... I, I, I feel oh, look at that. Kane, I, Kane, and White's, Kane and White's giving you some love there, too. Man, Kane and White is the Yo. man. It's, uh, What's up? Actually, that's another reason why issue five is like my favorite because he did one of the alternate covers for him. And it was like, oh my God. <laughs> while, while you're here, Kane, I, I, I'd be remiss awesome. if I didn't say something. One of my boys, Mark, who I do Wakanda Whiskey and Blurred Them show on Fridays, usually. He loves your artwork. I think he's probably one of your biggest fans. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that your art is tremendously appreciated by him. And me. Uh, my God. I, <laughs> by me? Boy, my God. I mean, damn. Damn. Yeah. Well, so, um, Blood Syndicate's fun because it was a sleeper for the original milestone. Like, right. people like us would go, damn, Blood Syndicate, Blood Syndicate. But, but when I would mention it to people, they'd be like, wasn't that the Street Gang one? And I was like, did you read it? Obviously you didn't, right? <laughs> but everybody who got on this book, every variant cover, ev everybody who got on this book brought like an A++ game. Like, I felt it coming coming off the pages. Like, it was beautiful work all around. I loved it. Right, right. I mean, then, 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 whew. I mean, you had so much to work with too. You know, shout out to, as you mentioned, Ivan Velez Jr. for, for writing these characters and the backstory in such a way that was, and I say this all the time, the book was 30 years ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, yep. And then for having sure. the the dope artwork by Criss Cross back in the day and doing these designs and man, you guys had had some, so it must have been a real pleasure to have to have this type of material to work with. So let me ask you this. We know that the, the this epi, this Blood Syndicate epilogue book that's coming out in the Milestone 30th Anthology book comes out on March 21st. Um, I've been told by DC that Blood Syndicate Season 1 collection, the whole collection of your Season 1 book comes out on May 23rd. Holy um, any idea uh, when, when Blood Syndicate Season 2 would be coming? And, and, and if so, what, what can we expect? Uh, I do not know. I have learned some things about my future on this show right now, so I don't know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, uh, listen, something big is about to happen to the Dakota Verse, and I mean really big. And you're like the, the, you're like the third or fourth person to tell me that that I'm doing these interviews. Yes, yeah, something really big is about to happen, and that big thing is going to dictate a whole lot of storytelling. So. My plans for what the Blood Syndicate season two would have been are going to be massively modified by what this thing is. So I have my plans. They know that I want to do it. I've told them point blank, no matter what else I'm doing, I will clear my deck to work on a more Blood Syndicate if and when they want me. But listen, they got Ivan's number two and they did not call him. So there's a percentage of a chance that next time around they don't call me they call somebody else that they they you know want to take it whatever direction they want to take it i'm here for them i serve at the pleasure of the president so um i have plans i definitely definitely have plans for how things are going to go on on um on paris island <laughs> after uh, after these poor children took over the island <laughs> oh my god uh, I, I, had, I had, but, but you know, before, before I let you guys go, I had this weird question. 
in formulating this this Paris Island Tortuga concept, um, you've got all these people with all these powers centered in this one area. In order to make this new sort of government work, will you do you anticipate the blood syndicate? The blood syndicate is going to make use of those power sets for basic things like infrastructure and the economy. Yep, absolutely. It's going to be. Listen, the plan inside Tech Nine's head is what you and I are now talking about. He right. envisions a Paris Island that can be made the way it should always have been, right? Everybody who's lived in or grown up in the hood, uh, especially ones that have been around for a minute where you got born into it well after the heyday, right? Uh, when they first built those projects, they weren't built to be horrible housing. When they first built Cabrini Green, it wasn't built to be, well, actually technically behind the scenes it was, but you know they weren't trying to make it a dangerous place to live, right? They're trying to make it a place that could segregate out black folks, but they didn't want it to look unsavory. They didn't want it to be a, a hotbed for criminality and violence and all of that crap, theoretically. So he has these great plans, but there are people involved. There are people, there are people on the island that may not be happy with the home rule situation. There are lots of people who are getting superpowers, right? Where's Why is that happening? Why is that even happening? So he's he doesn't want to be the king. He wants it to be a democracy. But you know how people are when there's the person who sort of put themselves in the pyramid and everyone, he's got the charisma and or she got the charisma and they're the one taking the point and they're taking the hits and everybody wants to follow. You end up being the king whether you want to be or not. Yeah. And the king has to make some hard decisions sometimes, like hard decisions sometimes. Everybody wants you know. to be a king until it's uh, time to do some king stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know what you want to be? Everybody wants, they think they want to be the king. What you want to be is the prince. You don't want to be the king. You want to be the yeah. prince. In fact, yeah. you want to be prince number, you want to be the second prince, not even the first prince. You want to be the spare prince, right? Because you get all the perks and none of the responsibility. <laughs> right? So, yeah. so I have a lot in mind for that. And I, I would love to write it. But remember, there is a lot of talented writers and they could look at the same baseline that we set and go, oh, but we could go off to the left and it'd be something I would never think of and be awesome. So I'm just here for the ride, man. Um, I'm very interested to see what happens with this big thing that they're going to do. I hope I'm involved in that to some degree. I want to work with either Sean or Chris on whatever I do. I'm sure they'll throw me a third artist that I have not even pictured yet. Um, hell, bring in Canaan. I don't give Let's go. Like, you know what I mean? But I'm just glad Milestone yeah. Tracking is trying to hit hard. Kanan says, uh, Tech Nine with his yes. tech would make a unique and dynamic solo book. Jeffrey and Sean, you guys really put it that man, that would be so dope. Oh, I'm God. From your, from your words do, to I would God's do a four ears. Issue. I would do a four issue Tech Nine with Sean. Hell yeah. Hell that, yeah. that would. Sean, so, yeah. Oh. So, somebody call up Reggie Hudlin. <laughs> Yeah, make noise. That's the way this stuff happens, by the way. Like, guys, the I'm, audience I'm, has I'm, to make noise. You got to buy it. Quite as I, I might do a tweet on that. It. I might do a tweet on that tomorrow. <laughs> Tag him on it. We need a solo book. <laughs> I, um, I, so, I, look. There's so much in this. Yeah. Anyway. Sean, Sean what, 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 do you have any other projects with DC coming up? At the moment. Uh, well, there's a cover... That I did a homage cover to an older DC Comics cover that that should be coming up at some point. I'm not is sure. That, is that gonna be for Milestone or? Uh, it's for Milestone. Yeah, yeah. Um, Can you tell other, us other which that, title it is for? Um, it might be one of the. I don't even think I can. Can I talk? You about can't tell me. I don't want to get you in trouble. So don't say. Hey, if you, if you, is it Marvel? <laughs> don't talk about it. <laughs> Oh no 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 no! It's, it's I still got <laughs> still got work to do for Marvel, but yeah, it's, uh... all right. What about what about some other work? So I know, look, I know that you worked on the Is Nana Werewolf Wear Spider book with Greg mm -hmm. Alisi. Yeah, that's that's dope. Oh, nice. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, um, Kickstarter nice. for that just closed out this morning. Um, at nineteen. 
Yeah, I think we ended in 19K. So that, that was pretty good. Um, and I'm very proud of that book. Extremely proud of it. Um, um, Should be. Look at that. Damn. Look at that artwork. That's that's incredible. That's was, absolutely um, incredible. Thank you. Thank you. What about you, Jeff? What do you got coming up? You have any other stuff for DC? Can I get some more Green Lantern? I uh, do not. <laughs> I don't think they want any more of me on Green Lantern, man. Come on, um, man! You left. You, uh, you 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 super powered my boy, John Stewart. You had my boy. I'm looking yeah. at. Speaking of Kane oh. and White, yeah, shout out Kane to Kane and White. White. Yeah, buddy. This oh, this 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 yo. cover was freaking dope, man. I need that's, to get Kanan White on the show. Kanan, it's absurd how good he is. Like, uh, <laughs> Kanan, can you can you come on the show sometime? Because I need to talk about stuff like this. I mean, this 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 cover's crazy. Look at my man with Look, the sword and everything. Um, I got some pictures in the DC, but I don't have high hopes for them. Chris and I want to do. We definitely wanted to revisit um, Global Guardians. We were all up in the Global Guardians. Um, I don't think there's any love for that either. Um, uh, I'm, I got some pitches in at a couple of the other companies, uh, and I'm doing Thanks, my, my, right now I'm, I'm doing my, uh, my, uh, my comp, my company's doing, um, Red Jack. The Winterman Project. Animated Shorts. Yeah. My company's doing that. Uh, so I'm kind of focused on that, right? God bless you. Um, I'm kind of focused on that right now. Um, this is your. Yeah, this I is mean, from what your YouTube page YouTube. right there, the Win the Winterman Project. Yeah, that's a YouTube channel. Yeah, that's a YouTube channel. We're going to be we're trying to do something here. I got a bunch of folks, uh, friends of mine that were happy to pitch in on this. Basically, we want to start making stuff that isn't down the middle: science fiction adventures, steampunk adventures, horror stories, things that you don't normally see folks like us doing in this way. Uh, not all of it's going to be cartoons, but a good portion of it will be. We figured out a process where we can we can do reasonably good, I think, solid animation on a budget, um, so it doesn't look like it's on a budget. Basically, it was the big the big sort of experiment. Um, mm -hmm. We were so happy with the res with the product and the response that we we're trying to rush. We we're trying to do it on a monthly schedule, but um, we're going to rush episode two into into. Uh, we're gonna post it up pretty fast, I think. Is is, is episode hyped. one available so, on that YouTube page right now? Yeah, it's there right now. It's there right now. All it's right. So right every everyone is watching um, this that, right now. That is not it. When when you're when you're done with with this, when watching us, I'd like you while you're still on YouTube, put in Winterman Project on YouTube, go to his page and like and subscribe that page for him. Let's give this brother as many as many likes and subscriptions as we can. So that way you can also know when Jeff puts up some new material and get notifications on it because he, he needs your support. Yeah. We, we talk about supporting well, these black creators all the time, um, particularly when they're doing their case, own works. Here's your opportunity you to help them. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to spend it, it, it's, it's literally oh. free. Just subscribe to his page. Help the brother Absolutely out. free. There's not, I mean, unless YouTube puts an ad in, there's not even any ads. It's just, here's the thing. Come take a look. If you dig, tell a friend. Um, I am terrified of crowdfunding, so. Oh, look I'm at that. Dr. My, Wizard, Dr. Wizard my, is going to I'm play going to your stuff like for I was told. So that you. Wow. You out of your mind. A whole lot of tales about how our folks. Can we get away with that, Dr. Wizard? Oh, my God. Yeah, I was going to say, be careful. I don't think we can have. I don't think we can have five sound. Five minutes but... of this thing right now. I don't think so. <laughs> it's only five minutes. <laughs> well, that's that's a that's a and brief excerpt for you guys out there. Uh, go to Winterman Project. Help you know support Jeffrey and and, and like his page. All right. So yeah, and we'll make beyond that, can you guys tell their fans where they can follow you on socials? Keep up with what you're doing. Uh, Sean, Winterman you got a website, right? On uh, Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, my website is, uh, I have a main website. Um, I got it because I just thought it was weird that a lot of comic artists just didn't have websites. I was like, this is strange to me. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's just uh, SeanDamianHill.com. Um, you can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, just that Sean Damian Hill. You have, I went to your website, you have a picture from a book that you just did, the Bishop book, right? Mm -hmm. 
yeah. the X-Men Bishop book. And there's this picture, a splash page, as you did, where Bishop goes again. And I even posted it as soon as that book came out because I love that page. And you have the art on that website. Is that is that picture for sale? Uh, I do have I do have a store, and a lot of Bishop pages are up on there. Not all of them, but like um, a good amount. And I think three have sold already. And we'll, I we'll, 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 we'll talk right later. There. We'll talk later because I don't want anybody jumping in. We'll talk later. <laughs> I forgot. But here's his website, I'm everybody. Of, I'm going to be dropping a bunch of Winterman comics over the next six months, digital only. Um, okay. Uh, where are you going to Where are you going to yeah. be selling that, Jeff? Amazon. Amazon. Um, uh, if enough people buy them, then I'll do a quarterly sort of um, Shonen Jump type thing, where we just put all the stuff into physical thing. Um, but that's that, I'll have more announcements about that. When we get closer to the date, I'll let you know. I'll give up with some stuff to look at. Well, I encourage both of you as you as you create stuff and you and you're starting to promote whatever you're doing, uh, whatever books you're going to be working on, share it in the space. Let us know and feel free both of you to come back. Mm. We appreciate mm, having you this guy's here. Like, this is why I don't draw um, most of my own stuff. Dudes like this. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Uh, uh, Sean, you're new to this. Je Jeffrey is a Jeffrey's an old hand with us at this point. But at the end of these shows, we figure that once you've been on the show, you're you're a member of the family, and you've already been in the Black Comic Lord space for a while. So, for all intents and purposes, you're a Black Comic Lord. So, what we'd like oh, you to do is you. look at the look at the camera and say, yes. "I am Sean Damian Hill, and I'm a Black Comic Lord." I am Sean Damian Hill, and I am a black comic lord. <laughs> like, hey, you said you said that kind of you said that kind of sinister too. I mean, yeah, yeah, that was a little villainous right there. <laughs> Jeffrey, you you want to redo your your video because your your last one was wild. That's your call, dude. I don't even remember what I did. You, if you want to know, oh, what well, I'm you, at. Doctor Wizard, go ahead. Let get go. I'm Jeffrey Thorne, and I'm a black comic lord. Am I looking at the camera? Uh, yeah, basically, yes. yes. Uh, I am Jeffrey Thorne, and I am a black comic sword. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you are. Oh, that was a lot more cool. fun. That was like, that sounded like a... No, he's, 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 a, he's a trained actor. I mean, I mean, you, you, you didn't expect him less. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sweet! <laughs> shut up. Just shut up. Oh my uh, if y'all don't get that reference, Jesus. then you're way too young. <laughs> so oh, listen, damn. Um, oh. everyone out there, please support these brothers when whatever their books are coming out. With this milestone 30th anthology book, it's still up for pre-orders and pre-sales. Go ahead and pre-order this book. The pre-orders are please. critical. These guys get credit. They get help. You want miles, more milestone stuff to come out? Pre-order the books. Because it's the pre-orders that DC looks at and Milestone looks at to decide, you know what, the pre-orders in this are good. We're going to trust that these guys are making a good product. We're going to give them a shot to do more. So if you if you Please. like what you've seen, if you like what you've heard tonight about what they've done, and you'd like to see more, pre-order this book so that they can continue the story and give you more of the dope content that, that they've got going on in their heads and in, in their pens. Um, so yep. that's, 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 that's the pitch. That's the, that's my PSA. Uh, Look, we've okay. got a lot of, a lot of stuff that we've been working on. Um, continually we have our lives with Wakanda whiskey and Alberta on Fridays, real talk with rich on Sundays, <laughs> every quarter we've got the black comic Lord ladies live. They've got a dope one coming up with someone who I'm not allowed to announce yet. I'm glad I restrained myself cause it's pretty big. Um, and we've uh -oh. got our, our our Black Comic Creators interview series. Um, we've been happy and blessed to have these creators come and talk with us and come talk to all of you. And uh, we want to want to thank each and every one of you for checking us out and, and being nice to these people and these these great creators and uh, sharing the love. So go and support them wherever you can. Um, and with that, yeah, I bid you all adieu. Thank you very much. Take us out, Doctor. Thank you.